On December 2nd, 2018, Greg Berhalter became the manager of the United States national team. Three years later, in the summer of 2021, his teams defeated Mexico twice to become the reigning continental champions and the first ever CONCACAF Nations League champions. Even with those two victories behind him and a 71% win percentage while coaching the U.S. men's national team, Berhalter's tenure is mired in controversy. The weight of the U.S. team not qualifying for the last World Cup still hangs heavy on fans' hearts. Then why continue to hire MLS coaches to grow Team USA? Is U.S. soccer failing the team by not going after a European slash South American and Berhalter coach? has not seemed to inspire confidence this World Cup qualifying cycle in a growingly rabid fan base. Berhalter doesn't have Bruce Arena's winning accolades, Bob Bradley's aura of intensity, nor any of the great international coaches' tactical minds. With the most talented generation the U.S. has ever produced, pressure is constantly rising with the one question everyone wants to know. What does make Greg Berhalter the right man for the job? To understand Greg Berhalter, we have to go back to 2011. The Arab Spring was in full bloom. Its Arab neighbors nervous of how revolutionary feelings. William and Kate are just tying the knot. And that's the reward. And a 38-year-old American soccer player, now turned coach, has just taken his first head manager role at Swedish club Hammerby. With a long and successful playing career at home and abroad and in World Cup teams for the US. Greg began thinking of his coaching philosophy even before standing on the sidelines. What brought you to that philosophy? Um, I think as being a defender myself, I always had a hard time um, processing teams that had a lot of movement that wanted to disorganize us. It was very, when teams were straightforward, that's when it was the easiest for me to play against. So as I'm playing against that, I thought, okay, that's what type of team if I was coaching that I would like to set. Greg Berhalter was now the first American to ever manage a professional team in Europe and it's here we get the first glimpse at his style and ambitions. For me, it's a great stepping stone. I think it's a, it's a great place to express my ideas and, and to get a, a team moving in the direction that I see fit. And for me, it's a great opportunity. Hammerby is a proud club founded in 1915 of the Stockholm City Center. They spent the majority of their time in the Swedish First Division. But after falling to the Second Division, the club looked for a radical change in the coaching and manager role. Greg Berhalter took over a team that was mired in poor results and trying to fight their way back from the depths of the second division. After barely missing promotion in his first full year at the club, he was sacked a year later in 2013 for, quote, a lack of attacking play. At the time of his sacking, Hammerby were in eighth place. Soon enough though, Greg found his feet as a sporting director and head coach of Columbus Crew, and here we truly get to see the development of his tactics and mindset. And is well known for prizing his team's tactical system over the individual players who comprise it. He likes to make tactical tweaks for each game while retaining an overall philosophy of how the crew should play. These core principles are pressing, possession-based football, and fullbacks that push high, covered by a deeper lying midfield pivot in front of two centre-backs. This kicks off a five-year period as his tactics mostly pay off for his Columbus Crew teams and they quickly become known as a difficult opponent for anyone in the league. Another part of Berhalter's strategy is to counteract his opponent. His crew only missed the playoffs once in his five-year tenure. Jesse Marsh and the New York Red Bulls had counter-pressing, Patrick Vieira's NYCFC had possessional tiki-taka, but Greg beat them both with his man management and strategic innovations. There is a dark side though. This can also be Greg's greatest weakness, as he is known to try and implement complex ideas that don't necessarily translate to a fluid game. And that means that sometimes his stylistic rigidity creates issues when his teams are pressed to find new ideas. This can create frustrating situations for players who want to play with more freedom. All coaches have their positives and negatives, but this does seem to indicate a consistent problem across Bearhalter's teams. Greg is now finding it harder and harder to avoid criticisms of his uncompromising tactics, even with the US soccer media that yeah, refuses today. to do much more than grovel Just at the feet. 
of the United the States Soccer Federation. Not being direct enough or not. Yeah, I'm not I'm not too sure, but it just felt like we, we couldn't we couldn't break them down. Obviously, they defended well, but uh, yeah, we just needed you know some new solutions and. Uh, yeah, obviously it wasn't good enough. After five years in Columbus failing to win any major trophies, Berhalter entered the recruitment process to find a new coach for the U.S. men's national team. And on December 2nd, 2018, Greg Berhalter was hired to the position of head coach. The hiring decision by the United States Soccer Federation came with valid criticisms of nepotism and the refusal to interview successful European or South American based coaches. While we now know the candidate list started with 11 names, the U.S. Soccer Federation only interviewed two people, Greg Berhalter and Oscar Pereja. While ignoring coaches that asked to be part of the process like Tata Martino, Juan Carlos Osorio, and former Spain and Real Madrid boss Julen Lopetegui, all of whom had higher win percentages and more international prestige than Greg Berhalter did. So what made his hire so much more appealing? The hiring process wasn't the only question for the United States Soccer Federation, as Greg Berhalter's brother, Jay Berhalter, was second in command to the U.S. soccer president, Carlos Cordero, and had been in the organization since 2000, serving as the chief operating officer. Jay was not on the committee that lured Greg Berhalter away from the Columbus crew following the 2018 MLS season, but he was involved in the hiring earlier that year of Ernie Stewart as US M&T's first general manager. Ernie Stewart led the process that ended with Greg Berhalter's hiring before being promoted to the US Soccer Sporting Director after just a year as the general manager. After calls of nepotism and favoritism, Jay Berhalter stepped down from his post early in 2020 after 15 years and two stints with the US Soccer Federation. Whether it was nepotism, a poor hiring process, or something else, Greg Berhalter now stood at the top of US soccer with the hopes and dreams of a nation's passionate fan base on his shoulders. Early in his tenure, Greg Berhalter dismissed many key veterans that played a large part in the USMNT's rise over the past decade, quickly phasing out players like Michael Bradley and Josie Altidore, making it a point that this team is now firmly led by the generation of new talent. While there are obvious drawbacks to missing veterans in camp, Greg Berhalter has made it a point to allow his young stars to build ownership among the group. Christian Pulisic, Weston McKinney, and Tyler Adams have all worn the captain's armband for the United States. Bearhalter's man management has seemingly paid off as well, building relationships with a treasure trove of talented dual nationals who have committed to the United States. Serginho Dest was slated to be the starting fullback for the Netherlands over the next decade, but decided on representing the United States. Yunus Musa was between his birth country of the US the country he grew up in England, or the country of his parents' heritage, Ghana, and made the shock decision at just 18 years old to represent the United States going forward. Ricardo Pepe is one of the latest additions to the team, with the war for Mexican-American dual nationals heating up. In the summer of 2021, Greg Berhalter took two very different U.S. teams to the Nations League and Gold Cup and won both tournaments defeating Mexico in each final. The Mexico coach Tata Martino had bested Berhalter in their MLS clashes, winning four of their five possible meetings, but lost both finals when their international teams met for competitive trophies. So the casual observer may ask, with the highest win percentage and the highest points per game ever of any U.S. coach through 35 games, why are some fans still really concerned with the direction one, of this sometimes team? Sometimes changing to a, 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 f a four one three two, and it was tough to break down, man. It really was. And you know, we needed much faster ball movement. You see, I think you know, you any everyone can see from the outside. It just took way too long on the ball. Um, you know, it allows Canada to shift not skipping passes, not, play, not playing um, behind them enough. So uh, we have to work on that. Uh, and we have to figure out ways to break down a compact defense. Rigidity sure. and complex ideas don't necessarily translate effectively to teams when you don't have much time to implement those ideas. National teams only have a few times a year to get together and build chemistry, unlike club teams that play almost every day together. And we must remember as well, players are people too, not just pawns in a game. Bearhalter is learning the hard way that his pawns may want more flexibility and freedom than he's willing to allow on the field. 
His inability to solve problems during games is also troubling, sometimes preferring to stick with a strategy that is clearly not working. In the recent World Cup qualifier against Canada, Greg failed to make any substitutions before the 83rd minute and did not use all five allowed even though it was the middle match of three games in seven days. The United States tied that game against Canada and went into Honduras with only two points needing a win away in CONCACAF to get their World Cup qualifying hopes back on track. All the talent in the world, the US's hopes were already in danger of going to the next World Cup. But that's soccer. Sometimes logic counts for nothing and belief and team spirit decides games. Playing away in San Pedro Sula needing three points is a heavy burden for any team. And after going down 1-0 at halftime in a hostile environment, Greg did make brave decisions. Changing formations back to a 4-3-3 and taking off John Brooks in favor of a more stable midfield. The US went on to salvage their qualifying hopes, beating Honduras 4-1 and ending the first qualifying window with five points good enough for third place in the Ocho. It's still unclear whether that was a blip on the radar or if Greg has learned from past mistakes and tried to improve on his weak areas. Will the Honduras game be a turning point in Greg's coaching career? His personality and rigid style has brought him some modicum of success, but has also mired his teams in mediocrity. The big question is, can he learn from his mistakes and become the coach needed for the U.S. national team to reach the next level.